Thank you very much. I'm good. Mbali, I'm good. Let's pray. Father, we're so grateful and thankful indeed for this gracious moment and for us to come to mix and mingle our voices in worship and praise to you. Thank you for the privilege to know you, that you're a good God, a kind God, a loving God and a merciful God and God of truth and justice. Help us, Father, to comprehend your word as we congregate around the word. Give us a, pro a privilege to get something good from your word to help us to live a life that pleases you, to prioritize what you prioritize, to love what you love, and to do what you want us to do. I pray for everyone under the sound of my voice and those that are listening through uh, the stream in this congregation, all kinds of platforms. I pray for them that, Father, they would be part of the anointing that is evident and that is released by you today in this service. That, Father, they would hear the words with the same spirit of love, concern, same spirit of prayer, of lifting people up, so that, Father, they be who you want them to be. We come against the devil who lied to try to lie to people. And, uh, and if we say Satan, we've got no part in people's lives, and we speak the order of God in their lives in the name of Jesus. Amen. And um, I want to talk to you. Thank you very much. I, wanna, I want us to go to Matthew chapter 14. I want to take another different dimension on, on, on mental health and on emotional problems and mental challenges, and I want to take a different direction. And uh, I'm not one who does negative topics. When I give a theme, most of my themes uh, point to a solution. But today I just want to come from a different angle and give you a theme that says, help, I'm sinking. Help, please help, I'm sinking. Okay? I want to talk to you on that subject. Please help, I'm sinking. And we're going to look at scripture. So let's go to Matthew chapter 14. And we're going to look at some verses. My key text would be verse 30, but it would be good for us to start from verse number 22. Immediately Jesus made his disciples. I'm reading from the In New King James translation, and I'll read it from the Amplified and the NIV as well. go before him to the other side while he sent the multitudes away and when he had sent the multitudes away he went up on the mountain by himself to pray now when evening came he was alone there which means alone in prayer and I that I might come back to it alone in prayer but the boat was now in the middle of the sea which means and remember who's in the boat go back to verse number 22 immediately Jesus made his disciples his disciples get into the boat and to go to the, to the other side while he sent the multitude away. So he's sending the multitude away, but he constricts, he, he, made his, he makes his disciples to get into the boat to go to the other side. Verse 24. Now the boat in, was in the middle of the sea. Of course, it is his disciples. Tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. Now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them walking on the sea, and now notice that in scripture, this is the only time Jesus walked on the sea. He didn't do it anywhere else. Right here in Matthew chapter 14. And verse 26, and when the disciples saw him, they saw him seeing him from the boat, walking on the sea. They were troubled, saying, it is a ghost. And they cried out for fear. Underline that word fear. So let's track some of the emotions that seem to grip, some to characterize this group of preachers, group of apostles. And they, they cried out for fear, which means they're afraid. Preachers are afraid. Okay, for so cried out for fear, verse 27. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Be of good cheer. So he's coming the fear by a message of good cheer. Be of good cheer, it is I, do not be afraid. So, in other words, it says, Be of good cheer, know who I am, and you will never be afraid. Can you see that? I want to read it like that. It's very important for you to see that. Because he says to them, I'm going to read it the way he says it, and I'm going to read it the way I interpret it. Okay, he says to them, uh, Jesus spoke to them saying, be of good cheer. Okay, why is he saying, Jesus, be of good cheer? Because the Bible says they cried out for fear. Write down for every fear you have, God is a word to counter that fear. Okay, God has a word to deal with fears, and he deals with the word. He, he, Jesus says, I'm going to show it to you now. 
here's a way of dealing with things. I'm dealing with the emotional part. I'm dealing with all of your life, particularly chasing the pursuits and the, the, game, the dreams that God has, has given you. Remember that when I talk about mental challenges, I have a vested interest. I'm talking from the perspective of those that are hard on life and are going for the best, going for the jugular, going for what God has for you. In your doing what God wants you to do, going for it, doing studies, doing business, doing greater. I just want to deal with things that can come up that can set you back. Things that can um, discourage you and make you never become who you want to become. You may be wanting to get a marriage right, make sure you get your relationship with your son right, get a relationship with your mother, your, your, your sister right, you may be with your boss right, you may get a relationship with yourself right. Maybe you're wanting to study, to work, to do business, to do whatever you want to do in life. So this is not just only, not in a bad way, a message that is meant for people who are necessarily have checked out in life and not doing anything, sitting down. But also for those, I'm going to show it to you, who are readily going for the next most needed level in their lives. Okay, The most needed level of their lives. Okay, Let's go on reading. So the Bible says, let's, 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 stay, let's stick with the thinking. So Jesus is saying to them, remember he told them to get into the boat. So technically they're in the will of God. They're going there doing exactly what God said they should do. And because it says get into the boat. And so therefore they're following the Lord. Kind of you could put it like this. These are people in obedience. Okay. And by people in obedience doesn't mean people who are spiritually strong. And this is the Bible wants us to weigh things and to be spiritually minded for us to see that even though they're obedient, but the, the, they were fearful, obedient people. <laughs> even though they were obeying God, Jesus has gone into the boat, they say, yes, sir. <laughs> God said, pray, you said, yes, sir. But there were other things about the, what God wants you to see in that journey that you're taking that's going to expose the fear that you have never dealt with. And the Bible says when they saw him walking on the, on the, on the, on the sea, and they, when they saw him walking on the sea, the Bible says they thought it was a ghost. They cried out for fear. Okay? The Bible says they cried out for fear. I want to try to mimic what they did. I don't know exactly how they did it, but listening to the words, I can try. I mean, cry and fear. <laughs> I'm going to try to put it together. Let's read it first before I do it. It says verse number, um, in verse number 25. Now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them walking on the sea. And when his disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying it's a ghost, and they cried out for fear. How, what does it mean to cry out for fear? Oh, no! Oh, oh, there's a ghost! There's a ghost! Oh, 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 Peter, here's a ghost! They cried out for fear. They're afraid. They're crying out. It's not a welcoming cry. It's not a cry. It says, hey, Jesus, by the way, oh, no, oh, look at him, look at him. He's doing something never. No, no. The first reaction to a godly move, God is, God is moving. Because God, God is the God of the first move. They were responding to a good move of God. What, what was God move in this, in this circumstance? He was walking on the water. When God moves and wants to take you forward, most of the time we respond with fear. Okay, the reason why we respond with fear, it's common among us as people and as Christians not to read God correctly, but to read God from our background, from our past. Okay, they did not see God. They, when, what do we mean read God? To see what God is trying to do. God by walking on the world is trying to say, it's time for the next level of miracle. Because it's his disciples, they are learning from him. It's a time, in other words, in, in far as God is concerned, it's time for a new lesson. It's time for another lesson. For them, a new lesson for you to follow me and learn the lesson. But they're saying to him, no, it's time for us to, reg reg to regress and go back to our traditional fears we were told when we see someone walking on the water it's a ghost and God says no you were told that when you see someone walking on the water it's a go it's a ghost but I'm teaching you when you see someone walking on the water it's me God says it's me when God does the first move you must mark it in your life and mark the days, the times when God made the first move in your life. When he, when he was teaching you new things. When, when, when he allowed, <laughs> when he allowed in, your, in your space, when he allowed in your job, someone who was full of hatred, who was cruel, and you thought it's, it's the devil. While you did not know that God was training you to be more loving in the cruel people and to be more resilient when people attack you. You did not see the hand of God. You failed to see God's move. You thought it was a ghost, the devil, but it was God himself training you. Don't only look at what is happening. Look at what is producing in you. Okay? God's, God, we call it the principle of God's first move. Let's find out verse 25. 
Now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went walking on the, on, the, on the sea. When the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a ghost, and they cried out for fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Be of good cheer. It is I. Do not be afraid. So for every word of fear, cry of fear, Jesus is a word. He says, Don't, you know, be of good cheer. It is I. In other words, be of good cheer. It is me. And when you know me, fears will go away. It's when it's a knowing God that fears will go away. What are they afraid of? The fear of the, number one, the fear of dying. What, what do you think went into that fear? Into that fear bag, that bag of fear that they were carrying around. They cried out for fear, and Jesus is, is, not, is not even you know, implicating them. It's not Jesus alleging or creating a false story about their level of fears. He says, it is I do not be afraid. What was in that bag of fear? Fear of death? Fear of the unknown? Fear of... I don't think God told me uh, to go to the other side. I, I, let me put it differently. Even though God told us to go to the other side, I don't think God told us to die like this. He, does he hate us this much to bring us to a point that we would die like this? Allow us to see ghosts like this? I mean, if he loved me, if he had told me, he had sent me to tell me to get into the boat, everything must be honky dory, everything must be going right. But I did not say an for things like this. The Bible they said they're afraid. Okay? So when God takes us to higher levels, we need to deal with our fears. We need to deal with our fears. All kinds of fears that we have. Fear of rejection. Fear of having no money. And fear of losing a job. Fear of being rejected. Okay? Fear of your reputation going down the track. They know you to be this lady who's prim and proper. If you're now going to come and evangelize and tell them that Jesus saves if you're going to come to this guy who works with you in the, in the company and, um, and, and Jesus tells you and you're, you're also a court director and you're a Christian and Jesus says, tell him about Christ. And Jesus says, and you're thinking, he's gonna, I'm going to lose my reputation if I tell him about Christ. He, he, I know he's thinking of me being a good girl, so I need to kind of like uh, decide whether do I still want him to see he's a good girl or this preacher girl, this Christian girl who's so in love with Jesus. Kinda, you're thinking of your reputation. You're thinking, should I tell him or not tell him about Christ? All kinds of things, all kinds of fears that we have when we have to to do the will of God. The fear of losing money. The fear of losing a job. The fear of, of being talked about. Look at her. We're working. She's telling me about Jesus. The fear of being made a fool. Fool for Christ. All kinds of fears that we have. We need to deal with that. And it's a legitimate text that the obedient were also fearful. The obedient in the text. The twelve were obedient. They were also fearful. And before I get to other parts of the text, I don't want to you know, pass by easily on the fear part. Jesus addresses the fear. He says, be of good cheer. You need a different mood produced by the word for you to drive away fear. You need a different attitude produced by knowing the word for, for you to drive away fear. And the, the different mood, what word produced a different mood? Jesus says, be of good cheer. It was a word coming out from Jesus' mouth to them, be of good cheer, that was going to drive away the fear. For every fear, you must have a word. And that is why, if you read scripture very carefully, you'll find out that they tell us that in the Bible, there are 366 fear not in the Bible. 366. One for each day. Fear not. God has a word for fears, for daily fears. Okay? A daily dose of that word. When the word comes in, it brings a different attitude, a different mood that drives away fear. Okay? Jesus deals with that. And in an, in an unfamiliar circumstances, unfamiliar territory. Let's go on reading because it's very important. Uh, we, we need to drive, drive, get to some things. And the Bible says that they cried for fear. Verse 27, immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, do not be afraid. 28, and Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. So Peter says, Lord, if it's you, command me to come. Now, how many are they in the boat? Twelve. Who's making the request to come to walk on the water? One. So one out of twelve, right? Don't forget that. I'm going, to work with, I'm going to work with that later on. So he said, Jesus, let's see what Jesus says. If Jesus, if this was meant for him alone, Jesus would not have allowed Peter. Because he would have said. Now, if Jesus was walking on the water as the son of God, no one else was the son of God on earth at that time. Only Jesus was the son of God. If this was meant for a son of God, Jesus would not, would not have said to Peter, come, walk on the water. That, so, therefore, Jesus was here was not operating as a man of God. He was operating a man full of faith. Okay? Let's go on reading. Okay. Okay. So he said, come. So verse 29. So he said, come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, understand. For Peter 
to action the word, Jesus' invitation here to step out. Come down out of the boat. Okay. Come down out of the boat. He had to leave something behind to step into something new. And some of the time when you're going to walk with God at a higher level. Remember now this is a lesson. Jesus, he, this, he made his disciples get into the boat. Which means a lesson. He's their master. He's their teacher. He's teaching them how to walk on the water. And he's saying for you to step into the higher things of God. You've got to step out of some things. He stepped out of the boat. Out of it. He left it behind. There are some ways of thinking, ways of feeling, ways of looking at the truth, or when he's looking at life, that God is going to have you to step out of because they are limiting you. They are not allowing you to, full, to experience the best that God has for you. Some of these people who go to step out are friends who have a narrow vision of life, who think less of you. Number two are people who are preaching too much self-love because the leaven that remained behind, they love themselves too much to expose to themselves to dangerous learning opportunities. They love themselves too much. I'm saying, no, 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 no I'm not going to go there. No, no, no I'm going to stay here. Write it down. Too much self-love produces a non-achiever. I'm not going to go there. I'm not gonna, no, no, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to go there. You're afraid. They love themselves too much. While Peter's strength about this, he knew who was, was calling him to come. He knew, the, if I, I, he knew Jesus very well. He said, if he's working there and I trust him, I know he will never mismanage my life. Okay? You've got to step out of some things. You've got to step out of narrow thinking. You've got to step out of little faith. You've got to step out of your fears. You've got to step out of the mental blockage that you've never seen anyone in your family do it. Other people say, I'm not doing it because I'm not. No, Jesus. Peter had never seen anybody do it. And Jesus is the only time he walks on the water. So history is being made at this moment. And Peter has smelling the great moments of history. He says, I'm not missing the opportunity. Because great moments of history present you with an opportunity. And Peter says, I'm not missing the opportunity. No, I'm not. I'm not, I'm not, I'm gonna, I'm not gonna miss the opportunity. I'm gonna grab it with both hands. History is being made right here. Her heroes are being produced. It's a God moment, it's a divine moment. And Peter says, I'm not, I'm, you're not going to leave me behind. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come. I'm going to come. I'm, 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 I'm going to come. I'm going to come and follow you, Jesus. He had to step out out of the mode of thinking that says, I have never seen anybody in my family do it. I've never seen my friends do it. Because God is calling you to do things that nobody's ever done. But, you, but you're following him. Okay? okay. Let's go on reading. The, the Bible says, verse number 29, So. So when Peter had come, come down out of the boat, he had to leave the boat behind. And one writer says he had to leave. Remember, the 12, the 12 disciples were chosen by Jesus was a good team. One writer says he had to leave the good to go to the best. Because good is the enemy of best. While you, you, you rave in being good, you deprive yourself of stepping into the best. Okay? Remember in English, is good better best, isn't it? <laughs> In terms of comparison. If you are sticking around the good, you are depriving yourself of stepping into the best. While the company of the twelve was good, he was prepared to leave the good for the best. And God is calling you to experience the best in your relationship with him. There's more. You've seen a good God. Now you need to see the best God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Peter had to step out of that. These are basic principles that we need to see. Now let's go on reading. It says, verse 29, so he came, he says, when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the sea to go to Jesus, but when he saw that the wind was boisterous, in verse 30, which is my key verse, when he saw that the wind was boisterous, now remember, he did not follow because he saw, he followed because he heard the word. He said, Lord, command me to come. You remember, he followed because there was the word that went out. Now, remember, now, look at this, let's compare the two. And I want, I'm going to take you slowly because this is a core part of my teaching. Okay? Let's go back to verse number, uh, verse number 28. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come on you on the water. And he said, come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he goes because he was told. He was following the word. But he sings because he sees. He follows because he heard the word. 
but he's sinking because he sees the wind. Now let's look at the, compare the two, the seeing and the hearing. Okay, having heard the word. Let's go to verse number 30 again. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid. Fear comes back the, the third time in my text. Fear comes back the third time. The first time, the disciples were afraid and they cried out for fear. Number two, Jesus says, be of good cheer, it is I, do not be afraid. Number one, fear is in the mouth of the disciples. Number two, a message that drives out fear is in the mouth of Jesus. And three, fear makes friends with Peter when he uses the avenue of looking at the problem. When he saw the wind is boisterous, he was afraid. And let's read verse 30 again. When he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sink. He cried out, Lord, save me. He began to sink. When did he begin to sink? When he saw the size of the problem. When did he start out walking on the water? When he heard the word, Jesus says, come. When he allowed what he saw to be bigger than what he believed, he began to sink. So we must keep these two things in tension. I'm going to let you think about it because I'm going to walk around this path. I'm going I'm to I'm tread this path very carefully. It's very important. When did he walk on the water? When Jesus said, come, which means the word was given. So with the word, we can do things we've never done before. But with the sight, we can withdraw from things we were doing that we've never done. That is why the Bible says we walk by faith and not by sight. Not by seeing. When he saw that the wind was boisterous, he began to sink. When he heard Jesus come, he did something he had never done. So now, who do you want as a preacher in your life? Do you want the preacher that always tell you that, look at the problems, look at the economy is bad, look at the wind is boisterous, look at the problems you're facing, look at the drugs your son's going to sink, look at, the, look at the divorce rate, look at what men are doing and um, cheating, look at, look at other, how unfaith, what type of a preacher you want, do you want the one that is showing you the size of the problems and you become afraid, or you want the preacher that says, come and you start walking on the water, he says pray and you start doing things you've never done before, you have to choose who you want in your life to grow your potential or to shrink your faith. I don't want a preacher around my life who's going to make my faith shrink. If the word says it, and right here he was right in the middle of a word project. He was believing God for better things when he began to see something. And sometimes, I'm a, and one writer says something very important. I don't mean it in the bad sense now, so that you think of me as a denialist. I'm not a denialist, I'm a pragmatist. I'm very real as a preacher. I, pre I cut life at the point where life is real. I study life, the events of life, and, and, and therefore preach to provide solution. I don't necessarily call myself just a preacher. I am a preacher, but I call myself a solution provider. So I can't provide solution for problems that don't exist, that are just an imaginary in my mind. So don't accuse me of that before I say this. But I want to make this statement. There comes a time in your life when you want to do big things. You, you have to stop believing what you see and start believing what the word says. Amen. You want to stop believing what you see and start believing what the word says. Because when he started factoring what he saw, he, when he saw the wind was boisterous, the Bible says he was afraid and beginning to sink. The source of fear was what he saw. Now write it down. What's the negative part? Now, we, we, only in what we're reading for today now. Okay, I can argue, I can discuss in a different light in different days if when we have time. But remember, I have to stay loyal to the text, to the biblical verses I'm reading. For today, for only what we're reading. It means to us, sight what we see. If you continue looking at the problems, it becomes bigger. And it will kill your faith walk. Remember, it was faith walk for him to walk on the water because Jesus, he walked on the word. So one writer says, Peter did not walk on the water. He walked on the words that Jesus told him to come. The words became a strong support base on which he could walk. Okay, okay. So, so, so you must be aware. Now, it's at this point where I need to talk about what I call faith killers. Now, remember, it's not only faith that is 
Jesus had made, has made, is making an investment in this team in this particular test. Of course, there's faith. They needed to believe. Number two, he says of good cheer. He says joyous mood. Be, be, be happy. Be joyous in the midst of the storms around you. So Jesus had made an investment of a good environment to birth greater miracles. Notice, Jesus could not have told Peter to come walking until he had cleaned the air. He had cleaned the atmosphere. You can produce great miracles in thick, fearful environment and faithful atmosphere. In atmosphere where there's a lot of fear. You need to first clean the atmosphere, get rid of fear, then give birth to walking on the water. And God is calling on us to watch the two things. Oh my God, I wish I had the time, I'd preach it. God is calling on us to watch the two things. Watch the atmosphere. Remember, Jesus had to deal with the atmosphere. He knew he could not do something big with a bunch of fearful apostles. He could not draw them to come to his level as long as they were gripped by faith, gripped by negative emotion, gripped by complaining and bitterness. He needed to take them higher. He had to clean the negative atmosphere and introduce a new law. Be of good cheer. Then he led them to a miracle. And God can't lead you to the next greatest miracles without removing your fears. He's going to deal with your fears. You will deal with things that are going to curtail and be a faith killer. And we see that fear in sight became a faith killer. When you're continuously looking at what people are saying, continually listening to what people are doing, continually l- listening to what, how negative people are, are criticizing you, how they speak you down, how they don't support you, okay? And it, and it kills the faith. It kills the momentum for you to go after that which God wants you to do. No wonder that you're sitting back and willing to try because you know what is going to be said because you have heard it being said about someone else and you're afraid it's going to be said it to you when you do it. And that's why you never started. In my world, based on this text, Jesus is finding difficulty to make friends with you based on what we're reading today. Jesus is, making, is finding difficult to make friends with you because you are too much listening to people and you're not listening to what he says. And he says he's calling, you, he's calling you to a higher level, higher level of living. He's calling you to higher dimensions of power. He's calling you to higher, level, higher levels of effectiveness. He's calling you into, into greater moments of increase and productivity and anointing and favor. And God wants to do greater things with your life. And God wants to visit your potential. He wants to stretch your potential. He wants you to step into things and levels you've never seen before. You've never seen anyone in your life doing before. And God is saying, I can't do that unless I deal with fear in your life. <laughs> At that point, and now remember, let's go back to verse 30 so that I can give effect to my topic. Verse 30 says, And when, when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. At that point, Jesus, and he's addressing himself to who? To the Lord. He's asking the Lord to the Lord to do what? To save him. At that moment, the Lord Jesus was looking at a sinking Peter. At a sinking man. And that man who was sinking happens to say a prayer. Lord, save me. I'm sinking. Yeah. Hey Lord, I'm saving. I'm sinking. If we're to go deeper into that and, uh, and, uh, and look into it, how many times did Jesus look at people who are facing different circumstances? In this particular test, he's facing Peter, he's sinking. And Peter is saying, Lord, I'm sinking. Now notice, he's not sinking because he's in sin. He's living in sin. He's sinking because he's doing the right things. He's following Jesus, walking on the water. For Peter, he was enjoying the second level of obedience. The primary level of obedience was for the entire group, the 12. And Jesus had said to them, let's go into the boat. But out of the 12, there was another level of obedience for Peter that the leaven had not tasted. He had followed Jesus. Because it says, if it is is you, call me to come and I'll come walking on the water. And Jesus had said to him, come and walking on the water. He was walking on a higher level, higher grade of obedience. Second level of obedience. obedience. He was following Jesus on the water. He was doing good. He was not insane. He had not run away from a prayer meeting. He was not AWOLing from a prayer meeting. He's right there where Jesus wanted him to be. But he's still sinking. So therefore, sinking is not for people who are not doing nothing in life. It might find you might be doing the right thing and yet you're sinking because there's certain things that you're not putting in proper place. And I want to talk about that. I'm going to come back to Peter. 
He's facing Jesus who's sinking. Sorry, Jesus is facing a Peter who's sinking. Now, Jesus faced a woman. Now, let's, let's, let's look around scripture and look at the different people that Jesus faced. Jesus faced a woman with an issue of blood in Mark chapter 5. And the Bible said she was a woman with an issue of blood. Who came to Jesus? At that time when she came to Jesus, a couple of things were clear based on the record of scripture. Number the Bible says she had, um, she had spent all what she had. There was nothing better. She had been to many doctors and spent all what she had. She was broke, number one. Jesus faced a broke woman. Broke. No money. Broke. Empty. Sentless. And the Bible says she had become worse. Mark chapter 5 verse 25. For there was a woman with initial blood, spent all she had. There was nothing better, but rather grew worse. She was worse. Worse, now listen to this very carefully. Now, I'm going to come back to Jesus facing a sinking man. I'm just looking at different parts of scripture. Jesus facing a different people. In Mark chapter 5, he's facing a broke woman. Broke, number one. Low self-esteem. And the Bible says she was becoming worse. Worse, think about it. What does worse mean? You've gone to many doctors. The Bible says she had been to many doctors and was nothing better. When that means all the doctors said, we can't help you. At that point, when we hear a specialist report, a report from someone who knows what, you, what you're dealing with, a, a medical report, a specialist report, a doctor's report, what is going to happen in your mind? There's going to be low levels of hope. The more they tell you they can't help you, the more hopeless you become. So Jesus has faced a woman who was broke, low levels of hope in life. You are alive, but you, you, you're, you're kind of like you're not hoping that it will ever be fixed. The words worse, the Bible says becoming worse, produce this situation, which means you need to accept it. She was worse. You know, the concept of worse, or let me put it differently for you to understand it. Okay? In other words, because she has a, a physical malady, she has a, a physical challenge, she was sick in her body. Outside, she was facing worse inside she had faith because remember she came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment outside i'm getting worse but outside i'm getting more powerful and if you are going to become something big in life you must know the two contradictions and know how to harness your faith to overcome the worst on the outside what's getting worse might be your situation at home getting worse your money situation getting worse your job situation getting worse her health situation was getting worse and the bible says she, it was, she was getting worse she rather grew worse it's a biblical expression but on the inside thank god faith was growing so faith can grow in your spirit while worse is happening on the outside write it down it's very important for you to know okay faith is, faith is on the inside is she the only one in this class in the bible no abraham was like that faith was growing on the inside while the bible says he was now turning 100 his wife was turning her 1090 and the, the womb's wife, the, the, the womb of the wife, the Bible says, was now dead. It's worse on the outside, but faith is strong on the inside. There's something about faith that you must know. It can hold the worst outside to account and still drive your life to results. If she had allowed the worst on the outside to dictate the next step of her life, she would not have gone to Jesus to touch his garment. She allowed the faith on the inside to push the worst on the outside and to take actions of faith and touch his garment. Where are you in life? And God is calling on you. Remember, faith and fear. Faith and worse. God is calling on you to feed your faith, to frustrate the worst. And I don't know where people get the story from that we as preachers, we don't preach about things that are getting worse. See, right here in front of our eyes, I'm preaching about it. His situation was getting worse. I'm not denying it. But that's not all we preach, that things are getting worse. Read the whole story of the woman with the initial blood. No story. We, we, is there the word worse in the Bible? Yes. Let's go to Mark chapter 5, verse 25. That's not all that we have in that, in that biblical text. You know, people want us to say, accept that things are getting worse. Oh, please accept. Yeah, we do accept that things sometimes they do get worse. We're not denying it. But that we don't allow the getting worse of things to make us not come to church. We don't allow the things that are getting worse to stop praising God. We don't allow the things that are getting worse to stop thanking God and believing God for an answer and great things. We don't allow the things getting worse to terminate my faith project. We don't allow the things that are getting worse to stop me from trusting God for better things. We don't allow the things that are getting worse to stop me from believing God for a better answer. We don't allow the things that are getting worse to stop me from, from speaking my faith while things are worse and say, I've got the answer. 
It's what you do with the word study that matters. That's very important. Let's go to make Mark chapter 5, verse 25. It says, now as a, in a certain woman, he had a flow of blood for 12 years. And had suffered many things from many physicians, which means many physicians are doctors. And she had spent all that she had. She was broke and was no better, but rather grew worse. That's what my Bible says. She grew worse. That the Bible says grew, which means she became worse and worse because it's growing. The worse is growing. And so the Bible is picking in important words to define the worst situation. The worst is becoming worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. And the same woman who at the beginning of the story is worse, look at the ending of her life. Look at verse 34. Let's go down to verse 34. Same woman who at the beginning of the story, she was characterized by things getting worse and she's broke. Look at the, at the ending of the story, verse 34. And he said to her, Jesus speaking to her, daughter, your faith has made you well, not your worse, your faith. So her faith challenged her worse. No, it was not her friend's faith that challenged her worst condition. Now, don't hear me wrong. Don't hear me wrong. You do not contribute things getting worse in your life and your friend contributes faith. It must be faith in the same person on whose life things are getting worse. Yeah, so I'm not preaching faith to your friend. Ah, pastor, things are getting worse in my life. Can you teach my husband to be my faith partner, to believe with me, or teach my friend? No, no, no. Yeah, I'm going to teach them how to believe with you. But we must get you who's facing worse things to believe first. Look at her ending. Her ending is bright. Her ending, remember, according to her sickness, based on the book of Leviticus, and, and, and the woman who had her kind of condition, she was not supposed to come and touch a preacher. She was not even supposed to come in front of the people. But Jesus opens as someone in front of everybody listening and say, daughter, she has no name. The Bible says, verse 25, when she's introduced in the story, he says, a woman with an issue of blood. One writer says, she was a woman who, she's, who, who, who was issue-fied. She had issues. Because I'm an issue, little sister. What's your name? But right at the end, Jesus says, daughter, your faith has made you well. The same woman who, whose condition was worse is now a woman now who's dancing and rejoicing. And that is why we must hold the two intention. Things, your mind might be getting worse. Your mental sickness might be getting worse. Your emotional state might be getting worse. Your relationship with friends might be getting worse. Your relationship with husband might be getting worse. Relationship with your kids might be getting worse. Your relationship at work must be getting worse. Your situation might be getting worse. And your friends coming on the job front. Your financial situation might be getting worse. It's not, write it down. No matter how worse it becomes, it's no license to give up. Put it differently. When is the right time to listen to the message of faith is when things are getting worse. Yeah? Because this woman, yeah, yeah, yeah. Jesus says, your faith, not your worse, has, has made you well. Dot, go home. She's doing what Peter could not do. When Peter began to see that the wind was getting worse, he got consumed with the wind and began to sink. This woman says, I refuse to sink. I'm going to challenge my worst. So Jesus has met people who were broke, worse, low levels of hope, and externally things are not looking good. There's no hope around. But right at the end with Jesus, we're looking at the master. Somehow the Lord is able to, uh, to embellish your faith to work with your faith to produce, to produce something good out of the worst situation. He can produce a winner out of a seeming loss of victory, out of a, an almost situation that could have produced a failure. God knows how to turn it around. And that's going to affect your mind positively in the right direction. Because now you believe God. Faith is of the heart. Believe the word of God. How is the faith in that worst situation fed? You feed it with the word. How do you feed the faith? You feed it with God's word. You don't deny that things are getting worse, but don't also deny what faith can do. That's the problem I have with many people. They say, just accept that things are getting worse and then get worse and then kill yourself and commit suicide. Things are getting worse, give up on life. Get worse and start drinking. People want to add on other things are getting worse. And the friends and all kinds of friends around you, they say, oh, things are getting worse. Gonna, why don't you try something else? Leave the faith. No, 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 no. No, no, no. That's not how it works in Jesus. Jesus, knowing everything that had happened to the woman, he still said, woman, let the whole world know that things did get worse, but what saved you was your faith. He says, Jesus says, if we can keep on investing in that faith, we'll turn out better and good like this woman. I see your, your ending is much more brighter, even though your now is worse. Let them laugh at you. Let them criticize you. 
Let them speak about you. Let them throw stones at you. But God is working something out for you. As long as you receive his word. And his word is building faith on the inside. You know that God is what he says he is. He is who he says he is. And you know God's word that God will do what he said he will do. And God tells you you are who says the word says you are. As you hold on to it. As you build your faith on it, nothing in life will ever stop you. You will come out, out of situations, almost death situation, and come out alive. Jesus met a woman who was broke and what the situation was getting worse. Number two, in the same chapter, Jesus met Jairus, a man who was confused in verse number 35. Matthew 5, 35. A man confused with many voices. Because the voices said, Matthew 35. Listen, just reach my... We're going to come back to the sinking man, right? I'm just analyzing around different kinds of Jesus men whose mental condition were, uh, were, were either confused or, or could have been swallowed up by the worst condition and low levels of hope. With the woman that we've just spoken about, if you mix what she was facing, what she was up against, low levels of hope, doctors telling her consistently that they can't help her, there's no hope for you. And number three, she's getting broke. And number four, she's rejected. All of those things are enough to produce a woman who gives up in life. But she did not give up in life. There's something about faith that keeps us daily connected to great life when things around us are not going well. Okay? Let's look at this man. Let's look at verse number 35. <laughs> While he was still speaking, some, of the, some came from the ruler of the synagogue's house who said, who said, remember, they said, Notice that the Bible says, some came, not one person, some, from the ruler of the synagogue said, who said? So these are voices of many people. Your daughter is dead, why trouble the teacher any further? So Jesus made a man whose name was Jairus, who was a man of many voices. There were voices in his life. And some, the intent of, and some intent of these voices were to separate him from Jesus. They said, don't bother the teacher anymore. In other words, at this point, when things are this bad in your life, Jesus is useless. He's irrelevant. irrelevant. Try something else. Try something along the lines of accepting many or many voices. Jesus meant a man who's confused by many voices. Okay, number one. These voices were voices of confusion. Voice, misleading voices. Some were misleading voices from friends and people. They mislead you about the core hope of your life who is Christ. They mislead you. Try something else, not Jesus. Are confusing voices. Are voices from the past. Are voices that separate you with Christ. As a matter of fact, some of these voices are lying voices from different people. And some of these voices are voices of people who have long been wanting to get a chance to tell you their opinion. A voices of opinion about this Christianity thing you've been following. And they find a chance now things are getting better, getting worse. What does Jesus do when this man faces voices? Remember, he's facing a sinking Peter. I'm going to come back to the sinking Peter. He's sinking. Number two, he's facing a woman who's broke, hopeless, and worse. Things are not going right. And if you know that, and, and, and I want to challenge some stereotypes, and, 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 and I want to challenge them very, as a pastor, with a heart of kindness. Because then the, there is some truth in the statements, but there's also untruths in the statements that are being, are, being, are being forwarded. They say when things are getting worse, you even can't pay attention to good word. No, that's not true. This woman was growing in faith. There's no faith without hearing the word of God. She made it a resolution. I'll stick to the word. Let things get worse. Let me, I'll stick to the word so that I can grow big in faith. Because sometimes the getting worse are things that are outside of your control. Things that you can't control. But what can you control? How much word you put in on the, into your life. How much Lord? So this man was facing voices. Voices of friends. Voices of aunts. Voices of, of parents. We all had one common agenda. Even though we say it differently, but at the end of the story, it might produce one effect. We must separate him from Jesus. We must separate him from the call. We must separate him from his effectiveness. We must separate him from these practices of pleasing Jesus. We must separate them from tithing. We must pound their minds, beating their mind constantly. 
they call it in, in, in psychology, sustained mental breakdown forces. Sustained. They keep on pounding all the time. Let's find out what Jesus does. Verse number 35. While they were speaking, some of them came from the rulers, the ruler of the synagogue's house, who said, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? That's verse 36. As soon as Jesus heard it, or I like it, as soon as. The, the, it, as soon, that word, as soon as Jesus heard it, which means quickly. Write down, there is no, uh, Jesus is quick. He's quick. As soon as he heard it, what does he do? That word was spoken. He said to the ruler of the synagogue, do not be afraid. Do not only believe. Can you see? Jesus is consistent in his rebuking of fear. He said, don't be afraid. Like he rebuked fear among his disciples. I'm going to say this in Zulu if it does not help you in any fashion or form. I'm, I'll try to carry it over in English, but I want to say it in English. In Zulu, that's what I say. The Bible says Jesus, as soon as he heard it, um, um, he, he said to the man, believe and, and, and don't be afraid. There are a lot of people when coming to prayer, they say, Have you heard of that? God is quick to hear, but he's slow to answer. But Jesus was not slow to answer. As soon as he heard it, he acted. So Jesus is quick against common, and, and, um, common belief. Let me put it like this. God will be to you whatever you believe him to be like. If you believe God is going to be slow, he's going to be slow. He's going to be slow. The Bible says Jesus, as soon as you heard it, you heard that was said. You heard faith killing words. Remember, this man had walking with Jesus, and Jesus had told them that I'll walk to your house to your daughter. In during the walk with Jesus, not only the not only the daughter got too much worse, the daughter died. Things got worse along the path, and Jesus said, "I've got enough power either to heal or to raise the dead." Okay, and many voices, and many of us are facing voices, voice of the media, voice of every of people and influencers on social media are saying all kinds of things against the gospel. I say all kinds of things about against Jesus and spirituality, knowing Christ as Lord and Savior. Against church attendance, saying kinds of things. And Jesus, as soon as he heard it, he, he counteracted the word. Okay? And number three, who did Jesus meet? He met the man at the pool of Bethesda. Okay? He met a man at the pool of Bethesda. What was specific about this man that he met at the pool of Bethesda? This man, the Bible says, um, at the pool of Bethesda, the, the angel of the Lord came and stirred up the water. And whoever got in first into the water was made, he, was made well of whatever disease he had. Whoever got first into the water. And this man, when Jesus asked the man, do you want to get well? His answer was very, uh, very clear and very revealing. Okay? And this, this is the man's answer to Jesus. He says, I've got no one. To, as soon as the angel stares up the water to put him into the water. In other words, I'm so bitter that I've seen other people get ahead of me at my expense. I've been so close to the water, and other people jump me all the time. You know, and he's kind of like saying to God, God, do you know how it feels to be jumped? I've been in this gospel thing for 30 years. People got saved two years ago. They got married. They came two years ago. They've got their businesses. I've been around here for long, Lord. Do you know the pain of being jumped? The bitterness of being jumped? Seeing other people getting their breakthroughs. Seeing other people getting their miracles. Seeing other people getting their answers. And you're just like, you're almost like forgotten. And Jesus came into, and Jesus faced a man who's, who's broken and, and, um, and, and maybe a little bit competitive. I don't know, because it says I've got no one. Maybe a little bit competitive. Maybe a little bit thinking, I'm being beaten by everybody else. Maybe a little bit bitter. I'm bitter against God. God, I've been praying. God, I've been trusting you. And Jesus faced a bitter man in that man. And Jesus says, take up your bed and walk. Of course, the reason why you had to wait, because yours was a special miracle in a special class. A special class, special delivery by a special person and a special miracle. And it will not happen the same way the others will happen. Others were waiting in queue for the water. You're getting the creator of the water himself. He's right in front of you. You're getting a miracle in a higher class. Now there's reason for the wait. Don't get bitter, God says. I don't know what you've been waiting for. I don't know what the things, but God is letting me to let you know. He has sent me to tell you that the delivery of your miracle will be by a special person, special way, special class in a special uh, in through a special avenue do not try do not distrust god there's a reason he has faced peter who was sinking he has faced a woman who was broke he has faced a man who has listened to many voices now he's going to face you with all of your issues with all of your fears with all of your things getting worse with all of your problems with all of your uh, family problems work problems personal problems mind problems heart problems he's not afraid he has faced them all he has come out on top he has an answer 
answer for everybody. He has an added solution. He has a solution for you today. He has sent me to tell you with all of the mental agitation, with all of the depression, with all of the low self-esteem, low help, low hope and no hope, things getting worse. People talking, people disbelieving, surrounded by naysayers, surrounded by haters and by people who want to separate you from Jesus, surrounded by friends who don't want to go to their best, who want to remain in the good, who don't want to experience the great things of God. How about you, Papa? You have been surrounded, but God is still God. And Peter said, Lord, I'm sinking. What does it mean is sinking? Write down. Let's give you 10 definitions before we finish today. What does it mean I'm sinking? Which means I can't cope. I can't cope. I'm sinking. I can't cope. Now let's go back to Matthew 14 now so that we can interpret it in the light of the scripture. Let's not bring new things into the text, but let's work with the textual things that are there in the verse. Let me show you something, Matthew 14. Number one means I can't cope, I'm sinking. I'm sinking. I'm sinking. I'm sinking. Now notice where he's sinking. He's sinking in an ocean. Now, an ocean does not respond to a finger push. Number one, ocean does not respond to a finger push. Ocean doesn't respond to a hand push. And ocean doesn't respond to a body push. Nobody pushes the ocean. It's a bigger challenge. Okay? He's, he's, and number one, he can't cope. Number two, let's look at that. Let's look at verse number 13, 14, 13. Let me show that. It says in the NIV, But when he saw the wind... He was afraid and beginning to sink. He cried out for fear. Number two, no, he was afraid. He was gripped by fear. Number one, he can't cope. Number two, he's gripped by fear. Gripped by fear. Gripped by fear. Or controlled by fear. In other words, while we see him sinking, he's making friends in his mind with thoughts and voices and feelings that disapprove of what he's doing. Okay. That's what fear is all about. He's making friends. He's visited day and night by feeling thoughts. Nobody hears the voices. Nobody sees the thoughts. Nobody knows the feelings that he has. Remember, feelings of being inadequate and feelings of saying, what were you doing? And feelings that say you will never make it. And that's why he began to sink. He sinks in front of a saving Jesus. He was not sinking in front of his enemies. He was sinking in front of someone who loved him the most and loved him the best. It was not about how much Jesus, how much Jesus, how much love Jesus had for Peter. It was not about how much word Jesus had for Peter. It was about how much fear Peter had in the midst of the situation. Sometimes we don't sink because God doesn't have power. We sink because we took too much time we delayed in dealing with these nasty voices that have been in your mind for the longest of time that tend to show up in your greatest moment. And Peter is having in his greatest moment in his life, no one has ever walked in the water among the church of other persons. He's the only one who walks in the water. It's a great moment. So therefore, fear unaddressed and fear undealt with will deprive you of your greatest moment in life. You will never become who God wants you to become. Even though God gives, creates the environment, gives you the word, he gave Peter the word. He says, I'm doing it. Gave him the example. And gave them the right moment and the right opportunity. Opportunities don't mean you're ready. Opportunities ask the question, are you ready? Many people have failed the opportunity test because they had not dealt with their fear fact. The fact, with the fear fact in their lives. Being afraid and the rejection and the nasty little voices and things that come up and grip you and bind you and take you back that you have never dealt with. And God says it's about time. It's not about him. It's not, it's, not, it's not even a reflection that he doesn't love you when you fail. It's not about the fact that he did not call you. Jesus said, come. The calling had gone out. God had done everything God needed to do. But Peter had not done everything he needed to do to deal with these things. Because above Jesus had told him, don't be afraid. But that which the sermon that Jesus preached, it looks like it did not find its way into Peter's mind because he's back to what Jesus had said, don't do. 
And all of us here have got the nasty voices. And I want to speak to that tiny voice in your mind. That tiny voice, you're thinking, I'm not, maybe I'm a little bit, I'm a little bit bulky, maybe I'm a little bit fat, I can't get a good man, or maybe I'm a little bit, maybe I'm a little late education, that's late educated, I don't dress well, that's why they don't come. I want to talk about that, that little voice that speaks into your mind that nobody knows about. That, anyway, why I start a new relationship, because even every time I start a new relationship, they break down almost at the time when guys want to lobola me. Why, why bother starting your relationship? There's these nasty, tiny voices that speak to you that are just your own private feelings about life. And God says they're not private anymore if they can stop you from achieving the greatness of God. We need, God says, we need to bring it on the table. Let's address it. Let's deal with it. Because they're the ones who are making you think all the time. Let's talk about that voice that says, kill yourself. You know that when you look at your mind, and the voice says, look at your mother very carefully and your dad. They don't treat you like you're their daughter, their son. They love your sister better than you. Because maybe your sister finished a degree. And maybe your sister did what? And you're thinking to yourself, well, I'm not a love child at home. And sometimes you verbalize it. You blame everybody except you. That's when the spirit of, of bitterness has taken a grip of you. And that everybody else is at fault except you. Your failure to deal with these voices is not going to produce a leader by blaming other people. And God says, it has to start with you. And let's clean up. It's an internal operation that cleans up. Because that's where faith resides. We know with the woman of issue of blood, what saved her was the good thing that was going on on the inside. Not the worst thing that was going on on the outside. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Faith that was going on on the inside. I pray as I close this sermon that may faith go on on the inside. May, may, may courage go on on the inside. May trust in God have gone on the inside. May you fight fear. May you fight rejection. May you fight bitterness. May you fight voices. May you fight that little tiny feeling that says you're not going to make it. You don't deserve it. That says you can just do anything. Throw yourself into anything. I silence that voice. I rebuke it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. May you become whole. May God restore you. May you become stronger. May you become like a woman with an issue of blood. Rejected. Completely rejected by society and doctors with no chance of ever coming out. But at the end of her life, she's dancing. Jesus is writing a book about her. It says, daughter, your faith has made you whole. May you stand in front of the throne and have God's love, God's affirmation saying, daughter, you came through it. You've done it, girl. You've done it, boy. You've done it. Jesus says, congratulations, you've done it. He only affirms you because your faith has pulled through. May your faith never fail you. Let's stand up on our feet in the name of Jesus. Lord help, I'm sinking. I'm sinking. I'm sinking in this nasty feeling of feeling inadequate. And I'm not up for the job. I'm the right, I'm not the right woman for the job. I'm not the right man for the job. I'm not loved enough. People they don't love me enough. Uh, even if I greet, I don't greet. I know people don't like me. They don't take me seriously. All kind of things. My boss doesn't even read my reports. Maybe the key member of the board of the company has not spoken to me personally. They just shake their hands with me. Therefore, I don't stand a chance in this company. All those self-negating words that push you down. And Jesus has faced it all. He faced a sinking Peter. He faced a broken woman. And lastly, the Bible says, he said to the woman, woman thou art loosed. You remember the story? Jesus said, woman thou art loosed. When Jesus said to the woman, woman thou art loosed, the woman was, the Bible says, her body was bent over. Which means she was ashamed and no confidence. Now one was not look, looking people eye to eye. And Jesus found her bent down, low self-esteem, and no confidence. With the posture of her body that says, I would rather not talk to you, leave me alone. Kind of a thing. But Jesus says, woman, thou art loosed. And I'm here to let you know, Jesus is saying, not only woman and men as well, you are loosed from your infirmity, from everything that binds you, from the issues that bind you. Father, we thank you for the word that speaks to us today. Help us to understand that Peter walked on the water because he heard the word. But he began to sink because he saw the wind. Help us, Father, not to believe what we see. 
those faith killers that come through the site, the avenue of sight, that make us believe problems are bigger than what God can do. And make us, Father, to check out from faith and never believe you the way we should. And have reasons why we think it can be done. And, and Father, listen to voices, different voices. Voices of the devil in our heads, voices of suicide, voices of inadequacy, voices of loss and voices of, of not, being, no, no, not hearing God, voices, misleading voices, voices in our heads, in our minds, in our hearts, in our spirits that tell us that God doesn't love you enough, that maybe God would never answer a prayer of a sinful person like you. Help us, Father, to deal with these negative aspersions and voices on our lives and on, on our success and prosperity. Peter did not sink because he was doing wrong. He sank while he was pursuing the best of his dreams. Help us, Lord, in the name of Jesus, when we pursue the best. Peradventure, maybe we step into the best not knowing what to expect and what we're dealing with. But we go there armed with prayer like Peter. That Lord, be ready to save us if we start sinking while we're doing what you want us to do. But we'll learn better next time. We'll be who you want us to be. We pray in Dorobo Shianda Rebebe Kurianda Rababa Hashia Lababa Haya. Come on, let's pray. Rebebe Hose Rebebe Kotore. I pray that Father, those that are sinking, Derebebe Kushunda, sinking in fear, sinking in hatred and problems and sinking in disagreements and sinking financially sinking emotionally Lord I'm sinking save me Peter put out a prayer to Jesus and Jesus saved him we're praying for those father that are sinking whose minds father telling them that they're not in adequate who might be facing, Father, unexplainable feelings and voices. Come on. Spirit of heaviness, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. Spirit of depressed, depressed mind, of depressive mind and de depression, I break your power in the name of Jesus. A mind that's thinking that is too much, I'm dealing with too much, I'm just not going to, I'm not coping. 